All right, let's get started. So this is our um, our last uh, chapter out of Moorcroft. So that's cool, right? Um, so the way things will go, and I'll say this at the end of, this, of the lecture as well. So we're gonna do this today. And then on Thursday, I give a lecture on chaos and randomness and how they apply to dynamical systems. Then, uh, so I say Tuesday and Thursday this week. Then the next Tuesday is gonna be an open lab. So we're gonna take class time for you to just work on your final projects. And so if you wanna come here, then I'll be here, maybe Eric, and then we can help you with any sort of last minute debugging you're working out or problems or anything like that. And then Thursday, um, that will be, uh, Eric will be giving a guest lecture on kind of applications of similar quantitative methods to some real work that he's doing now, like bleeding edge research and understanding things like uh, irrigation and how they relate to sustainability and sustainability problems. So like, you know, the types of uh, unique irrigation systems we have in Phoenix. Then the, la the, the week after that will be the last uh, regulation week of classes before finals week. And so Tuesday will be a, um, a, a review session for the final exam. Um, and, then, uh, and then Wednesday is when your final project and presentation, your report and presentation will be due that night. Uh, Thursday will be stage one of the final exam, works exactly the same way as stage one of the midterm. And I'll kind of massage the availability windows so you got some flexibility there, just like we did with uh, the midterm. And then during finals week, um, our you know, normal final exam period, I think, is on the Tuesday of finals week. And so similar to what we do in the midterm, um, it'll be stage two. Um, and then that'll be spread out over a couple of days as well. So you'll have some flexibility on when you want to do that. Question. Uh, well, so so again, so the because stage two is like all online, um, uh, I the time is on the Canvas calendar. I don't know off the top of my head. I think it's one of the nine a.m. periods, but I have to double check. So if you want to come here for stage two, you'll yeah, yeah you you can come during that. And um, again, I think it's on the Canvas calendar, and I can post an announcement just as a reminder. Uh, but otherwise, if you don't want to come in during finals week, if you just want to do it all at home. Then stage two, there's no need to. I mean, stage two doesn't have lockdown or anything. It's exactly the same in the midterm. So there'll be lockdown for stage one, and then it's collaborative and no lockdown for stage two. But um, you just only can collaborate with each other and only use resources from the course this semester. So uh, I'll summarize all that at the end of this lecture as well. But I just wanted to give you an idea of where we're going from here. So any questions about that? Checking about questions online. OK. So this chapter was kind of Moorcroft's wrap up chapter where we returned to some ideas we started with at the beginning of the text and the beginning uh, of the course. And so we're gonna start out and we say, you know, coming into this course or just kind of the average person, the common view of what a model is, is I think some people, if you really press them to say, what is a model? They would say the representations of reality. So emphasis here on reality intended to be useful for someone charged with managing and participating in that reality. So this is a, a, a view where models, um, accuracy, high fidelity, details is really being emphasized. Now, there are those types of models. And so as we started out at the beginning, we said those were our analytic or analog models with realistic detail and scaling kind of over here. But we've learned about a lot of other models throughout the rest of the semester that fall on different parts of this modeling spectrum. So the question is, you know, what are they useful for? You know, how do they fit into these things? And they had this example of uh, the race car simulator. So a PlayStation, I think in this case, might be getting a little dated, but um, so a PlayStation simulator here is saying that, you know, this has a lot of detail for a simulator, but certainly is, no um, drop-in replacement for driving a real car, especially at these speeds, um, you know, in these sorts of scenarios. And so the question is, is such a simulation model useful um, given that it's sort of just a game? Uh, so ultimately, even though it's, it seems to have a lot of detail, it really isn't all the way out. You know, it's not like sitting in a realistic car simulator that's where you're getting the vibration of the wheel and everything like that. So the question was, really, how do we evaluate whether this model is any good or not? And he gives this example where um, on a popular TV show, they took someone who was an expert at the PlayStation driving game, they dropped him into um, a real car and um, 
uh, you know, real high performance car, put them on a racetrack. And, you know, this is the first time they've ever driven the real car. And they, uh, they didn't do as well as they did in the simulation game. They kind of spun out a bit, you know, certainly were not competitive with respect to, to drivers who are used to driving on this real platform. So you might conclude that it's, you know, this simulation model was not very useful. But then if you kind of think about it, you know, if you drop the average person who's never had any background of this um, into such a car, you might expect a very different outcome, right? You know, so the person didn't wreck, you know, like there wasn't a terrible ball of fire at the end of this. They actually managed to survive, uh, you know, driving on the test track and they probably could have gotten better. So it was like a warm start to training on the real car. So they didn't have to start from ground zero. They could start from where the simulation left off. So that actually suggests that maybe this isn't such a bad result over here. So, um, so there's some transferable insight, even though the PlayStation game wasn't totally realistic, it had enough of the salient features of high performance driving so that the high performance driver could actually not end up killing themselves like they might've done down here. So that's, that's a positive outcome. That's a positive use of this. So one way to interpret this is these kind of lower fidelity models, we can say, well, maybe they're just better than nothing. You know? So they're a substitute for nothing. But maybe a more favorable way uh, of saying it is they provide general, generic and transferable reason. So rather than trying to learn on every, you know, you could, you could um, you know, go, drop yourself into every type of high performance vehicle and learn all the nuances of that vehicle, and then have to learn all the nuances of the next vehicle. But over time, you're gonna notice there's some similarities. Well, the idea here is what if you took those similarities between all those high performance vehicles and you packaged them into a lower fidelity model that you could actually distribute to people before they even have access to any of the cars. And in some ways you'd say, well, it's better than nothing, but Another way, you know, you're saying that you're, it's actually much more efficient. It's somehow beyond just being better than nothing because you can kind of provide them that transferable reasoning ahead of time. So then they just have to fine tune it later. And that's kind of what we're shooting for when we build these types of models. So basically on that side of it, we refer to these types of models as, um, as hard operations research. So these are models that have all of the um, specific, the detail very specific to a system that you would need if you wanted to actually run New York City, you need a high, per, a high fidelity model of New York City to test your simulation, to test your policies out on before you implement them on the city. But on the other side of this, we might refer to these as soft operations research models, and they're for making sense of these kind of wicked problems. And so let's say I'm not the manager of New York City, but I want to study generic problems that happen with respect to say poverty in all cities. Well, rather than studying something that might end up only applying to New York City, I can build a city model that has the salient features of New York, of LA, of Columbus, Ohio, of Athens, Georgia, whatever. And if I find that there's some common elements to poverty uh, and poverty prevention that apply across this, then maybe that gives me tools that I can export to multiple city managers simultaneously, and then they can fine tune them for their own cities. So it's, it's more than just being better than nothing, it's being somehow more broadly scoped. And that's really the point of these models is that these are more broadly scoped and these are more narrowly scoped. So sometimes you need the broad scoping, sometimes you need the narrow scoping. Um, it really takes all kinds to do what we refer to as just operations research broad. So that's kind of, I think, the message that Moorcroft was giving. And so to kind of augment that, like I liked this cartoon. So um, this is an XKCD cart cartoon. If you're not familiar with the background of XKCD, the comic there, the guy who, draw uh, who draws them was once an employee of NASA. He's, a, I think, a mechanical engineer at NASA. And... Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the video game, the Kerbal Space Program uh, game here, but, um, but he kind of has this, this graph where he suggests that he took you know, physics, he got a physics degree, enrolled in NASA, did a lot of uh, things involving maybe orbital mechanics. But in his perspective, he didn't actually feel that he really started understanding orbital mechanics until he started playing the game. 
So he could do a lot more kind of sandboxing and experimentation in the kind of toy game than uh, he ever could in building, you know, a, a single, you know, if, if you're building a Mars rover, you probably have simulations of Mars and things like that, but it's going to be very tailored to that, you know, to Mars itself. But if you want to learn the general principles of how to get things to Mars and how to get things anywhere else, then maybe actually something that's lower fidelity, that's not as tailored to that particular challenge might actually um, give you a, a, a greater increase in knowledge that's useful to you. And that's sort of what's being depicted here in this cartoon. Okay, so I thought that was kind of a nice, um, uh, a nice kind of capture of, of the, the utility of what we might look at as kind of like toy models. All right, so any questions about, does that sort of make sense? What we're saying here is that, that we don't view these lower fidelity models as being deficient. We just, they have a different target. They're for getting generalizable insight about you know, a broad scope of problems as opposed to specific insight about one particular problem. Okay. All right, so what I really liked about this chapter was this idea that Moorcroft brings up about transitional objects, which if you take any courses in sociology or like the sociology of learning, um, you'll hear this term boundary object or boundary work. So when you study how people come together from different disciplines and work together and how they make success, then we, they refer to that as doing boundary work. So you're doing work where you all come with very different insights and you have to somehow um, come together and find a way to talk to each other. And in sociology, they talk about building a boundary object, which is an object which captures the salient features of everybody's background um, allowing them to find some common agreement while being flexible enough for them to um, still see in the object specializations which make them differ from the other disciplines that are coming together. And this idea of a boundary object, I think, is, is very similar to what Moorcroft was referring to as a transitional object. When we get to the sort of shared understandings, we'll see that. So in the idea here, which I thought was really kind of a clever way to, to talk about this, is when you have a mental model, and you use it to build something in the physical world, which is consistent with your mental model. And then you can play with that in a way that you can't do in your head. So your mental model built this thing in the real world, and then you start interacting with it, and it doesn't interact the way you might have expected. And that causes you to update your mental model and possibly then remake your model, your physical model, your so-called formal model out here um, to, to test the new ideas that you've gained. So it's kind of a, a way of learning how to learn, like your own mental model is teaching itself how to iterate. So the physical model couldn't have existed without the mental model, but the mental model couldn't have gotten better without building the physical model. And that's why Moorcroft calls this a transitional object. It's a way for you to transition your mental model from one thing to the next to the next. Um, and I, I really kind of like this picture here. So, um, and I, what, when Moorcroft uh, talked about this, this reminded me of some other work um, from, uh, from social sciences and psychology um, where there's this, this so-called illusion of depth. And so like, if you look at an image like this, where you've got a red sky um, at night, you're probably not surprised to see a red sky at night. You're like, yeah, that happens all the time. But, um, and then you might even be able to say, what the red sky and night tells you about the weather the next day. You might even know these little phrases like, um, you know, uh, red sky and night, sailors delight, red sky and morning, sailors take warning. So, um, so you sort of learn that, you know, if it's the red sky is, you know, during sunset, we might have good weather the next day, but the red sky is during sunrise, we might have bad weather. So that makes sense um, in some sense. But if you really ask yourself why, like try to explain what makes the sky red and how does the color of the sky relate to the next day's weather? Why does that even exist? I, for me, that would be a very difficult thing to explain. Some of you might have a better, you know, maybe you've taken some meteorology or whatever, know a little bit more about the weather. But for me, you know, trying to tell exactly why the sky turns red and how that 
relates to what's going to go on the next day is going to be um, difficult for me to do. So, um, so this is an example of um, an illusion of depth. In the first box, I feel like I understand the sky. But if you actually ask me to explain it, I don't have it. So um, similar idea, low tide. So you probably wouldn't be surprised if I told you that low tide follows roughly after thir roughly 13 hours after the last low tide. So, you know, every time I've been to the beach, I kind of understood that 13 hours or whatever. Um, that's not surprising. But then if I asked you to explain why low tide follows 13 hours after the previous low tide, I'm guessing, at least for me, that would be very difficult. I don't know if I could exactly predict, like, why is it 13? Why isn't it 12? And, um, you know, and even if why was the 12, I actually had to like, think about it in terms of the moon and whatever. Um, I might have a hard time connecting all those dots. But, you know, I would feel comfortable with this statement up here that low tide is, you know, separated by 13 hours. So, so that's something that, um, you know, also exposes. When you ask me to actually form a model of why I can't do it. And so it exposes that I don't have as much depth as I think that I do. Uh, even simpler examples. I know how to write with a ballpoint pen. Guessing most of you know exactly what to do if I were to hand you a ballpoint pen and write with it. But if I take those pieces apart, um, you probably could get it back together. But if I were to actually ask you to write out how all those pieces interact together, um, it might be harder for, you know, like it might take you a while to figure out what's going on, maybe with these two pieces down here, for example. So, you know, even explaining how a ballpoint pen works, you know, we, we think we understand everything about how a pen works, but at least for me, um, I probably couldn't explain all of the working components of a pen. So asking me to build a model or to form uh, a consistent theory for how a ballpoint pen works exposes that I don't really know how a ballpoint pin works. And um, similarly, even for things like setting the table, I might know how to set the table, but if you ask me why does the fork go on the left, I don't know, it just, that always has. So, um, so the idea here, and this is something that Frank Kyle, um, who is a, I think emeritus professor now, but he's from Yale, he's a cognitive psychologist who's written a lot about this. And he says, you know, when you try to force someone to make a formal model, it exposes how shallow our explanatory ability actually is. And this is similar to what Moorcroft is talking about with a transitional object. If you think you understand how a gear train works, I would say to you, build it. You know, I mean, so Feynman had this quote about, you don't really understand anything until you can actually build it. The same sort of a thing. If, if, um, if once I ask you to build the thing that you say you understand, it oftentimes results in you realizing that really you don't understand how it works. So a theory is something that helps us understand how things work. So, uh, and I'm going to relate a theory to what Moorcroft calls a formal model, which is like our simulation models. So they allow me to um, engage in explanation of the world as opposed to just stating, you know, facts about the world. So this idea that I talk about the shallows of explanation are a consequence of people frequently trying to um, give explanation the absence of theory. Why does the sun rise? Uh, you know, you could come up with anything that's consistent with this idea, but if it doesn't have a consistent theory, then it's gonna be a very shallow. Like once I start probing you in your explanation, eventually we'll find holes. So a theory gives us sort of this cohesive material that helps build confidence in our explanation of how the world works. So theories are kind of important here. So this is what, so whereas, you know, Frank Kyle and Moorcroft, they didn't know each other, they didn't work together or whatever, but they're saying the same thing. So when Moorcroft is saying mental model, um, you know, this is what Kyle was talking about in explanation. And when Moorcroft is talking about this formal model, Kyle was talking about a theory. And so by being able to build a formal model, be it something physically in front of you or a simulation, then the idea is you're going to enhance your mental model so that you, over time, you can actually start telling people not just what goes on, but why it likely goes on. And so that's what's useful about these transitional objects. Okay, so that's sort of what the, kind of the, what I'm saying here is that when, um, when Moorcroft says formal model, if it helps, you can think theory. 
And I think those are kind of the same sort of ideas here. All right, so any questions about this general idea of transitional objects as theories that help provide us depth to our explanations? With the extension being that you might think you understand how you know, population dynamics work, but when you actually have to build a model of you know, fish population or whatever, you start realizing all the complications and well, you know, the fish can't grow forever, so there needs to be a carrying capacity. And, um, but you know, the, this carrying capacity, how do I set this carrying capacity? Where does that come from? You know, what complications does that cause? You, know, you start getting into the depths of it and you start realizing that you know, by building the model, you start realizing how much more you could have enhanced your understanding of population dynamics that before you, know, you might've just been able to spout facts about population dynamics. So it's very valuable to be able to build these models and build up our theories. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, so th this kind of brings us. This is brought up. I noticed uh, uh, at least at least one or two people met, mentioned in the perusal this quote from George Box: "All models are wrong, but some are useful." And um, you know, I think that that essence came out in some of what Moorcroft was saying. And um, and what I would say um, is models are defined by how they're used, not what they're made of. And so earlier in the semester, I defined a model, and you know, this will probably come up on the final exam, um, that a model is something that, broadly speaking, answers a what-if question. So anything that helps you answer a what-if question, that's a model. So it's a simple definition of a model, something that helps answer a what-if question. And so that was you know, sort of George Box's thing here, all models are wrong, some are useful. Kyle has a version of this as well. So Kyle says, um, you know, the, the normal usage of the term theory, so remember that's what we're thinking of form a model, has never been required to say a theory of everything. So what he means by that, and this goes back to our discussions about reality, a theory of how the agent for mad cow disease works does not require to regress down to particle physics to be a legitimate theory. A good epidemiologist or doctor or whatever will be able to tell you how a disease works, but if you ever ask them, well, but you know, how do the electrons work out in that? They're probably not going to be able to tell you and it won't matter because they don't need that to really understand all of the sort of pathogenic uh, pathogenic pressures that go on inside that disease so there's no reason to include all of that infinite regress down to all of those possible details you can stop at some level to keep the model simple enough and that actually ends up a lot of times making it more generalizable and actually box said roughly the same thing i'm not going to read through this whole thing here but basically the, these three sections that I've bolded, um, you know, up here Box says um, is that, that you really only need a simple model. And if you've, uh, in parsimonious models, simple models often provide really useful approximations. And he gives the ideal gas law. So if you, you know, a lot of you probably taken, you know, a, a, you know, first chemistry, maybe a second chemistry, maybe you remember from high school, PV equals RT or PV equals NRT, the ideal gas law. So he's saying the law, uh, the ideal gas law, um, you know, has these a couple of quantities and they, um, and certainly like things like a gas constant R will not be exactly true for any real gas, but still having these quantities is a useful approximation that's informed by the structure of what's going on in the gas. And for that reason, it's extremely useful. And so there's no need to ask the question, is the model true? All we really have to ask is, is it useful? Is it illuminating and useful? And so that's, that's really Box saying the same thing that Kyle was saying about, you don't need to throw in all the details. You need just enough to be able to speak to the question that you're trying to answer. So the emphasis in modeling is on aiding understanding, not replicating reality. So again, this is just sort of hammering home this idea that models don't have to be perfect representations of the world. And they're often better if you strip out some of those details because they can be more generalizable. They can tell you more about a broader set of things. And so, um, so yeah, so that, and the other thing models can do is help bring, if we're talking about a broader set of things, that allows us to bring in a broader set of people into the discussion. So, um, so any questions about what I generally mean here about you know, models are defined by how they're used, not by what, what they're made of. Um, models don't have to include all the details. Does this 
make some sense, at least this argument doesn't make sense, even if you don't agree with it. I know in the perusal, there were some people that said, you know, it's hard to understand how uh, models, um, you know, don't need more details. But, uh, but the idea here is that um, there's actually an argument that models need less details, need fewer details in order to be generalizable. And if you don't believe that, again, ask any doctor, you know, about the physics of, um, of how um, a particular condition works or something like that. And most of them won't be able to come have an answer, but they still are very good doctors and they're probably better doctors because they don't have an answer for that. All right, so um, the other thing, and I kind of touched on this earlier about boundary work and boundary objects is the other cool thing that formal objects do is they get models out of our heads so that we can share. And I'm hoping that in the final project, you've started to feel this as you all crowd around a monitor and you look at this simple little diagram and you agree and disagree on different components. Or I've even heard it as you work through homework assignments in class, you know, where somebody will say, oh, I think this should be drawn in this direction. And somebody else will say, actually, no, isn't it drawn the other direction? And some of it is like understanding the syntax of VinSim, but the rest of it is really understanding where the causal connections actually exist. And from your background, what do you think is the case? And from someone else's background, what do they think is the case? Once you write it all down in a way that you, in a language you all can understand, it helps bring things together. And so this is the picture that Moorcroft had of that, where you've got these different people with different backgrounds. You might have an engineer, somebody in business, somebody in design, for example, maybe somebody in conservation biology, and they're all coming together to figure out how to build um, a green building or something like that. And rather than just trying to talk on a Zoom call together, then instead they build um, this boundary object, this formal model, a tangible, it's, you can hold it, shared representation. And that formal model, it is contributed to by everyone's mental database. So somebody who's, you know, the whatever, the engineer or the conservation biologist, they've got a lifetime of information about their discipline, and they will try to enhance that formal model with the relevant features coming from their background. But their background is very different than everybody else's background. So gradually these things get added together and moved into this shared medium. So you, it's a way for us to bring in the mental databases from different people who have different backgrounds and, and sort of put everything together in a, and, and force us to reconcile our differences. So that we have to say that, you know, if this person thinks that there's one causal link and this person thinks the causal link goes in a different direction, that sort of forces us to talk about that and really figure out, hmm, do we really understand this process? And maybe run a new experiment to really see which direction it should go and then put the answer inside our formal model. So it helps us reconcile our differences and build shared understanding. And I, there's an example of this that actually was written up by, um, in a byline, this is my former PhD advisor, Kevin Passano, happened to write this, which is the reason it popped up on my feed. Um, but this was an example where um, it's, like I say, a, a system dynamic model of drinking events. So a multi-level ecological approach. And so this is an example where these are real images from the paper. You can see this is a VinSim causal loop diagram, and this is a VinSim stock and flow diagram. So this was a real VinSim model. And I can tell you that um, my uh, advisor, so my background was a background where I, we actually didn't use VinSim. So we used other mathematical frameworks to do the same sort of work. So this was an example where um, he contributed his dynamical systems background to someone else who actually built the model. And the rest of these people, as we'll see, if we look down through there, you've got people in social work, um, you've got people in electrical engineering, you've got people, um, you know, basically sort of social work and engineering coming together to talk about drinking events. And so the, the, this, the, the motivation was this paper um, was this idea to bring together these disciplines in a highly collaborative way to address this gap in the literature. And they said most of the literature that talks about drinking behavior. And so, you know, when someone decides to have another drink, only considers these static linear models, these statistical models that don't consider the dynamics of how things unfold. And those of you who've maybe participated in drinking activities might know that your attitude towards drinking might be different at the beginning of the night than it is at the end of the night. It's a dynamical process. And it is a social process as well. 
So again, you might uh, think you're going to go in for one sort of night and you come out of it looking at another sort of, uh, coming out of it, you know, seeing you've done different activities than you had originally planned for. And so, and really in order to understand the trajectory of drinking behavior, we need dynamics. We can't just use statics. And that's really what they're sort of saying. We need to build a dynamical model of kind of drinking decision-making that takes into account um, not only how things ever change over time, but also these social pressures. And so that's what they're sort of saying here. And as this line of work continues, they're hoping that this example expands to other groups so that you can have more examples of this multidisciplinary method of people coming together over these dynamical systems models. And so that's kind of an example of them building this community of knowledge. And that's a term that I borrowed from another paper from another group of people where really what we're seeing here is a cognitive division of labor. So normally you talk about division of labor, you say like, I'm gonna do part A of the homework, you do part B of the homework or whatever. And that's one way to think of it. Um, but you can also think of it as more kind of interdigitated where you can say that, you know, I'm gonna contribute my knowledge about conservation biology. You contribute your knowledge about business and marketing and so on and so forth, so that our model ends up integrating those in a way that's greater than the sum of its parts. And we sort of form this community of knowledge where the somehow the knowledge in the group is greater than the, than the sum of the knowledge of all the individuals. And we see that a lot in plenty of examples. So, you know, as an example in the, the, the ballpoint pen, there's probably no one on earth who knows how to build a ballpoint pen from scratch. I mean, from natural resources. So you couldn't send one person out in the jungle and say, um, you have as much time as you want, build me a ballpoint pen, all you've got is the jungle, go. And they probably are not gonna be able to build that ballpoint pen. They're probably not even gonna know where to start. You know? And even something like a pencil, it's, uh, it, you know, this seems like a simpler system, but there's actually this nice essay that I think a lot of people in B school read, um, especially if you're going to supply chain management called I Pencil. And this was written in 1958, well before the Apple I Pencil. And, um, and it's sort of this essay written initially um, from the perspective of a pencil coming into existence from scratch. And it goes into all of the details about, you know, the rubber trees and, and, uh, and, and the metal and how this metal is formed and all of these different things together. And it becomes clear that pencils emerge from a complex collective system. There is no central authority who knows everything, you know, to make a pencil. Pencils emerge from the community. And likewise, there's not one person in the community who knows how to build a whole pencil, who could have the knowledge to do all of the steps to build a whole pencil. So it's kind of an amazing thing that so much of the society around us has been built from people figuring out ways to bring their knowledge together so that the, the, the aggregate is much greater than what any individual can do. And that doesn't come without liabilities. So, um, so this is, you know, Lion Air. Um, why, why did I put a Lion Air plane up here? So for one, I'll say, you know, we can say the same thing about how to build an airplane from scratch. I can guarantee you that no one knows how to build an airplane from scratch. Again, like, you know, even airplane mechanics, you know, they, they know all the parts of an airplane, but there's still, you know, some airplane mechanics do one thing, some do the other. But if you want to actually build the thing from scratch, up from the bottom, from the natural resources, far too complex of a system, the knowledge that goes into building and operating an airplane is distributed. And yet, most of the time, um, airplanes stay in the air, they fly around, and we feel we have a lot of confidence that airplanes are safe, even though there's no one on the planet that actually knows all of the details about how an airplane works. So does anyone know why, why did I put up a Lion Air airplane that's a Boeing 737 Max on the screen? Does that ring any bells from recent news? It's not that recent, but maybe a couple of years ago. Pardon me? That was, there was a crash, right? So this is the, the example so that Boeing brought out the 737 Max and this was a new model of their 737 that had some slight changes in hardware and software that led to um, these planes. Uh, basically, in order to in order to to uh, to adjust their hardware, 
they had this software that had to kick in to um, try to make automatic adjustments. But if you were a pilot and weren't ready for this software to make these adjustments, you might fight against these adjustments and get into these awful back and forth where um, you'd end up um, actually end up, these planes would end up going um, into this, uh, this sort of nosedive where they, they'd end up kind of going to these oscillations where they climb and then fall and then climb and then fall as these two processes, like an escalation process. You have the pilots trying to balance one thing the software trying to balance another thing and these two balancing process escalate until eventually the planes crash. And so Lion Airs, uh, I forget which the flight number was, but they were the first example where like 37 minutes after takeoff, they crashed into the ocean. And it was due to um, the pilots not really knowing about this change in the software. And so that's an example where, you know, the community of knowledge has its liabilities. You know, so we can be overconfident in, you know, because of our, our illusions of depth, right? We can think we know how the airplane works when in reality, even the pilot might have important gaps there. And what's frustrating from a simulation perspective is, is when they went investigated this, they found out that in the simulator, it did the same thing. They actually had simulation engineers flying these things in sim and they were doing the same oscillations, but, um, that information got filtered out when it was reported so that when the marketing people got it, um, you know, at that point they said, well, there, there must not be an issue. So that was an example where actually building a SIM predicted the problem, but the lack of having a tangible model that brought everybody together um, prevented that knowledge from actually making it to decision making. So, um, so that's an example where, where, where these formal shared models are really important because, you know, the SIM would have actually, you know, prevented them from releasing this, this, this plane, but because the SIM, not everyone was involved in those studies, then it was a way for the information that came out of the SIM to actually not be incorporated by everyone else. And that led to this tragedy where they had these crashes of the 737 Maxes, had to re-engineer some of the processes, had to retrain the pilots um, in order to, for it to have a safe plane today. So, uh, so that's kind of, I think, an example where this um, community of knowledge, you know, is a good idea in principle, but it's really based on this idea that we have these shared understandings that bring everybody together. Yeah. Well, so from my understanding of this particular problem, uh, uh, most of the issues that were caused here were due to the software getting into a mode that was trying to be corrective. And that corrective mode ended up the, feeling like a perturbation to the pilots, which caused them to try to correct in the other direction, which caused the software to try to correct. And that's what led into these oscillations. So that's, I mean, it's like an escalation behind that. So initially Boeing said, it's not our problem. The pilots needed to be trained. And by the way, this was on page 356 of the manual, they should have read it. Um, and, um, and so in reality, I think the ultimate resolution was, you know, they, they obviously got more awareness of this, but then I think they also altered the way the control software worked so that maybe um, this sort of situation wouldn't get into play or they could, the pilots could override it and so on. All right. So, any other questions about this example or this general idea of models helping us reach shared understanding? And again, I'm hoping you're feeling this a little bit as you're working together on simulation models in your final project and in the homeworks where you kind of collaborated together in class and so on. Okay, any questions online? This is just kind of a wrap up of Moorcroft's take on modeling. All right, so, um, so I mentioned confidence in models. Like how do we build confidence in models? This is really important. Because once you build these models, they have trajectories that come out, but how do you really trust that those trajectories are any reflection of what might happen in the real world? And so um, again, going back to Kyle, before we go to Moorcroft, um, is they say that um, you know, one important thing here is that theories have scope um, and they can reach a natural boundary when they tie together a wide range of phenomena in a coherent account that lives or that links observables and unobservables. What he's saying here is we're going back to this idea that models don't have to contain all of the details, but they have to contain all of the important details. Once you have enough details so that if you 
um, that the model is consistent. So if you ask it a bunch of different questions and answers in sort of a consistent way, then you know that you've kind of drawn the boundaries um, appropriately. And by boundaries, what we're really saying is what to include in the model and what to exclude from the model. And so, um, the, so how do we know that we've reached the right boundary? And so this is going back to Moorcroft here. He says that we start with these tests of model structure and the boundary adequacy, um, so again, Moorcroft uses the same word boundary. So this is important in systems thinking and system dynamics and systems theory, where you're gonna see this word boundary, which just has to do with what variables do you put in the model endogenous and what variables do you leave out of the model exogenous. And so um, are the important uh, concepts inside the model. And then on top of that, once you have all those, have we captured all the relationships? So this, this is what we mean by structure verification. It's not enough to have all the variables. You have to have all the flows, all the coordinating networks, the connections between them. That has to be in there. Once all that's in there, then are all our formulas correct? So this is a verification step where we say, once we've populated all the formulas, do the units make sense? And then once we've gone through that, then if we've got consistent units, so formulas that make sense, we should be able to say, the parameters that make the outputs look right are these parameters that make sense in real life. Like if I've got a simulation of an airplane and in order for it to fly, it requires more thrust than the engines could possibly generate, then I probably, it's a bad simulation of the airplane because the airplane should be able to fly with thrust that the engines can generate. So that's what I mean, but we can look to see are the parameters consistent with our knowledge and then extreme conditions. So even if your formulas are correct and under normal operation, the parameters look like they're in the right ranges. If you take those parameters and move one or two of them way outside of normal operation, then do you get um, equations that still make sense? Like in a hypothetical reality where those parameters could be out there. Because um, if not, then that might indicate that you got lucky in the formulas that you formed here. And you happen to pick ones that are kind of close approximations of reality. But, are, but if your simulation strays a little bit towards the extremes, then you're gonna deviate from a good formula. So that's kind of the, the tests of model structure that Moorcroft emphasizes. And he has this example um, in terms of, I think a real project that he worked on with soap, with companies that are making soap and he, he hid the names um, of the soap companies, but kind of captured the salient features of it. And so in this example, this was a company that currently makes bar soap and wanted to start making um, you know, soft soap, liquid soap. And, and so, but of course, as you're making liquid soap, that's gonna take money away from your bar soap business because people at the sink are gonna start buying your liquid soap and not your bar soap. So the big question was, um, you know, how can we model the effect of introducing liquid soap, um, given that we're gonna get more sales from our liquid soap and we might get less sales from our bar soap. And then there might be uh, you know, competitors pressure here too. So as we introduce liquid soap, then that's going to affect how we relate to our competitors bar soap and so on and so forth. So they started out with this simple model where they've got their, um, how much soap, bar soap they produce, how much soap their competitors produce. And so as the market swings from them to the other competitors, they've got a flow that goes between the two of them so that there's always the same amount of bar soap kind of swinging back and forth. But as they introduce liquid soap, then you can get a loss um, out of their bar soap volume. You can also get a loss out of their competitors bar soap volume. And then so out of here, if they were to introduce a little bit of the liquid soap here, it's gonna reduce some of the bar soap. And then we're gonna see people gradually adopting liquid soap and the competitors might also adopt liquid soap. And so this is a simple model to try to grasp as we trickle in, so to speak, liquid soap, then how does it affect our, our liquid soap, our competitors liquid soap, our bar soap, our competitors bar soap. And at first this seems like a good way to good place to start from. But when you really think about it, it doesn't have the right boundaries. So there's a boundary issue here in that, um, for example, the, um, there they mentioned shower gels. So bars soap is not only used at the sink, it's also used in the shower. And so in order to really grit the whole market here, we really, even though shower gels aren't used at the sink, because bar soap and shower gels 
you know, people buy bar soap for both reasons, then we really probably need shower gels because that's just an important latent variable. It's not something we really care about observing, but it's something that affects the variables we do care about observing. That's what I mean by a latent variable. So um, that's one thing. And the other thing is structure issues. Maybe all the connections we have here don't make a lot of sense. Maybe there needs to be some additional interconnections. So with that, they said they revised the model that included the bar soap, the liquid soap, and the shower gels. And in, it was this much more complicated model, but it still has a lot of the flavor of the old model. Here, the bar is on top, the liquid soap is on bottom. You still have kind of the uh, them, you have the competitors. They've added in a supermarket here that has kind of their generic Me Too liquid soap and Me Too bar soap down here. Um, and there's uh, shower gels where they haven't modeled a stock of shower gels, but they have modeled flows of um, shower gel to bar soap conversion and bar soap to shower gel conversion. So um, it's gradually incorporated a lot more in here. It feels like we're getting closer to the real market, um, but there still might be some uh, structure and boundary issues. So um, for one, we're not really modeling all the details of what go on inside not only our company, but also all of the other companies. And so they expanded out and made a much more detailed model of them, a much more detailed model of the global company and a little bit more detailed model of the supermarkets. And they all kind of come together in a market here, just like in the global oil market, where you kind of had the independent producers, you had the cartel, and they all come together in a market that ultimately that's where price was set. So um, all of that kind of came together and gave us kind of adequate balance. So there's a bit of a soap bubble around the boundaries here. And so this, that's how they gradually build it up. So we always start with simple models and we add in as much as we need until we feel like we've captured all of the important details. And, um, and that was kind of the example of how they built that up. So that's just the test of kind of structural adequacy, but then we, we need to sort of see um, what, how the equations work and whether the simulation output makes sense and how to actually then make use of that simulation output to make use to understand um, you know, new insights about the market. But are there any questions about this general idea of how you start from a simple model, notice the things that are missed, add in the things that are missed, try to see if anything else is missed. And it's an iterative process where you keep adding in things until you feel like you finally included everything where um, you can probably stop where anything else you'd add probably isn't gonna change the output of the model. That's what we mean by boundary adequacy. Okay. All right, so, um, so after we've kind of done the boundary adequacy and the structural verification, then we're, um, the next sort of step here are these consistency uh, things down here, which are more verification steps where we wanna ask for one, if we, if we look in this model, we can look in every single component of this model at the formulas that we choose. And the easy thing we first check is are the dimensions uh, correct? So you should know that like if this um, uh, stock here is in units of thousands of tons per month, that's what we do is bar soap volume. And this, that means this flow is gonna be in thousands of tons per month per month, change in flow. And so that means that whatever formulas we put into this flow, then they've got to have that unit, thousands of tons per month per month. So, you know, a lot of times we were doing the birth rate, death rate stuff in class, then sometimes, you know, that was always the trick is it saying, do I multiply these things or divide these things? And that's where your, your dimensional consistency helps you with those formulas. So here I know that if my parameter, fractional rate of substitution, if it comes in, it's proportion per month. Those are its dimensions. And I know that the bar soap going into there, that's in units of thousands of tons per month. So if I want my output to be thousands of tons per month per month, then I know that just to get the units right, multiplication works because I can multiply thousands of tons per month by per month and I get thousands of tons per month per month. So it's, that's how we check the dimension. That's a verification step. Now you might still have the wrong formula. There's lots of ways that you can get the right units out, but this at least tells you 
a bunch of formulas that it couldn't be if they have the wrong units. Of the formulas you find that are the right units, then you can ask, when I actually plug in a real, say, fractional rate of substitution, a real parameter from the real world, if I then evaluate my formula, which is this substitution rate, if that substitution rate doesn't make any sense, if it's way too high or if it's way too low, then that might indicate that even though your units are correct, the formula is not, and you need to find a new formula that also has those units. And after all of that's done, if you've got something that the units make sense, the, the magnitude makes sense for the normal parameters, then the question is, what would happen if I made my fractional rate of substitution or I took my parameters and I made them really large, or really small, well outside of the norms? Then do I get, um, do all the other equations, magnitudes kind of change in the, the right way? And this is a case where like, if I got the right formula, then regardless of how large this thing is, this should probably never be negative or something like that. And so if you start, end up, you know, it's kind of exercising the demons of the model. It, it's kind of hidden in there that these negative numbers might pop up. But if I make my parameters really, really large, then I sort of um, perturb the model in such a way that if you can accidentally get negative numbers, they might pop up. And so if now you get negative numbers popping out of there because you made the numbers really large, then that might tell you that I might be missing something in this formula. I need to add something else in here to prevent negatives from ever coming up if it doesn't make sense for this thing to have negatives. So that's what we mean by dimensional consistency, parameter verification, and extreme conditions. These are verification steps just to make sure that your formulas are likely correct, or at least the right structure. Does that make sense what I mean by that? about the um, consistency, or um, I'm referring to this stuff as verification. Verification is like debugging. It's making sure the programming's correct before we make sure that sort of the, um, the larger scale modeling constructs are correct. Right, so those three steps, if I were to ask you the difference between those, I feel like you could uh, sort of mumble through something. Okay. All right, so once we've done all of that structural verification, our next step is what, we've, what Morkoff refers to as tests of behavior. We run the simulation. So you run the simulation and you get output one, which is this smooth line up here. So we're simulating over many months and we're getting an output, which is the antibacterial liquid soap volume. So the simulated volume is a smooth line and then he plotted real data on the same graph. And that's this line two, which is kind of the jagged line. And this shows us that when we choose realistic parameters, we get an output that's very close to the real output from the real system. So that gives us an idea that, yeah, this, I feel more confident about this model. I felt confident about the equations, but I wasn't quite sure about the whole model together. But now that I've run the whole model, it generates an output that's close to real output. So I now have more confidence in the model. So that's referred to as tests of behavior. And the last kind of test that helps us build up um, this is to sort of say, or right, that's great that it, I now have a good surrogate for the real system, but what do I do with it? You know, so that's like, this is like the ultimate test of building confidence for the model. If the model teaches you something useful in the real world, that's a pretty darn good model. And Moorcroft's example was this sort of fractional model idea here where he said, we can run this model with just us, that's line one, with just us and the competitors, line two, and with just us, the competitors and the grocery stores, line three. Now, his company that went into this, they thought that their main concern were their competitors, not the supermarkets. They thought the supermarkets were probably important, but you know, but it was a small effect. And the main, um, their main enemy or whatever, the main ones that you know, their main risks were in what their competitors were going to do. But what they found here is by creating a super simplistic model where just they were a monopoly, then they got one performance. When they just added the competitors in only, it really wasn't that different than the kind of monopoly where they were the only soap producer. So really, they're worried about their competitors, but there's not a whole lot of difference in their performance. The competitors and them aren't using that much of a market share. That they, There's sort of enough market out there that they both can coexist without having too much of a negative effect on each other, according to the model. 
Now with the surprising thing, which turned out to be realistic, um, is that when they added in the grocery stores, because the grocery stores um, could copy and under uh, sell or underbid, you know, these products here, then the um, then the the advantage that the name brand had, you know, plummeted. So really, it wasn't the competitors they needed to be worrying about. It was the Me Too generic grocery brands that copied them, and that was an insight that they didn't anticipate ahead of time. They ran the model. The model suggested that was the case. And then when they started piloting these things in real life, they found out that yes, actually the grocery stores are a bigger worry than our competitors. So, um, so that was a novel insight that they learned from the model that turned out to be true in real life. And that is the ultimate you know, way to build confidence in a model. When the model teaches you something that actually pans out in real life, that tells you that, man, this is a pretty good model. Um, I could probably learn a lot more from this model. So it's kind of like, you know, when you read a book and that book teaches you something new that's useful, you might go back to that book to read more things from that book because it kind of gives you confidence that book knows what it's talking about. All right, so those are kind of the three, um, the three types, the three ways that we can build. And maybe I'll skip this because I think I summarized them here. So morikawa has got this nice table that kind of summarizes these things together. The kind of tests of structure, and those are the things that we focus a lot on in this class. Um, and then in this class, we go into a little bit, we sort of get a visual fit for tests of behavior. If you go on and do more modeling, you turn this visual fit into a quantitative fit. You actually say, you quantify the difference between the simulated system and the real system. And then you actually can say, you know, one model is much better fit than another model. That's kind of outside of the scope of this class, but that's kind of the next step in what you would do. And then once you kind of feel like your model kind of passes the sort of behavior tests, then we try to learn from it. And, um, and the kind of the gray area here is sort of what we, we kind of look at through for in this class, where we say, you know, does it, um, does it compare to our expectations well? Does it, does it give us any surprises? Um, can we run partial versions of it and gradually trickle in, in things so that we can sort of find misconceptions like we did with the competitors versus the grocery stores? Um, and can we um, generalize? So can we actually learn something about say the car market by using a SOAP model? So you know, if you can actually get a generalizable insight that helps you in your other goals that aren't even related to the specific problem, that's a really good model. And that really helps build up our confidence in the model. So um, I think your final projects will probably be, you know, you'll probably get all the way through some of these and you'll hopefully get a visual fit that you can be happy about. You may not get to the point where you learn something really new, but that, you know, that's kind of the aspirational goal, but you probably won't get way down to this point here. But this is what we're trying to practice with the final project is building a model where you can go through all of these tests and start to move to these two, these two things here. So you can gradually get a model that is useful. And by useful, I mean, can be used over and over again to learn new things, potentially about the real world, even though it's not a real world in your computer. All right, so, and that's, I think I just sort of highlight these things kind of in the same way that I just did, just kind of broken up there. So any questions about those three uh, adequacies or those three ways we, we build models? Those three categories that kind of make sense. Questions online. All right, so kind of wrapping up here, um, I like to think at the end of uh, chapter 10, he's got this nice, he returns us to this modeling continuum. He's got all these models that um, summarize where you can find them, some things in chapter 10 and one and nine, seven, whatever. So it's like a, it's, it's a greatest hits of the whole textbook put onto this modeling spectrum from analog all the way to metaphorical. And if we look through this, then we actually see some surprises like World of Showers shows up in two places, the same model in two places, but the description underneath them is slightly different. So if I look at um, over here on the analog side of things, it says the World of Showers model, this is the two dueling showers where two people are trying to regulate the temperature of the shower. It said, well, this is a realistic model of temperature instability among independent shower takers. So if we were modeling showers in a hotel room with sort of the same hot water going to all the rooms, this would be a useful model for that very specific case of managing the water 
um, in the design of architecture for um, you know, a hotel with common you know, water supplies. So that's on the realistic side. But if we think back to this chapter where we talked about the world of showers, we also used it as an analogy. We said that it's also a model for understanding generically the competition for resources among independent uh, business units. So the world of showers was used as a model for Harley Davidson and how they had two arms that were competing for resources inside the same company. And they were getting oscillations among the two arms that were identical to the oscillations predicted by the world of showers model. So this goes to show that, you know, is the world of showers a model for motorcycles or my motorcycle production or a model for showers? And it's both, you know, it just depends on how it's used. And so that kind of goes back to, you know, this, this thing I said earlier, models are defined by how they're used, not what they're made of. It's not about how realistic they are. It's not about whether they include math. It's whether they can answer what if questions and you can use showers, you know, competing for hot water to answer what if questions about motorcycle manufacturing plants competing for access to the same resources. And that's kind of the point that we're trying to make there. All right, so questions about that wrap up about the modeling spectrum. Again, it's just sort of an overview chapter of everything that we've kind of done so far. Um, not a lot of new things added there, but except we've sort of started to formalize what we mean by building confidence there. So the things I want you to remember from this chapter are um, you know, the three different ways you can build, um, build confidence in your models. And more specifically, when we talk about um, you know, things like boundary adequacy, you know, what does it mean to have boundary adequacy or structural adequacy and so on. So that table with the kind of descending gray area, I would sort of focus on um, definitely the headings of that table, but and definitely that middle column. Um, but and then if you can, sort of the penumbra on the, the left and right, um, you know, those other type things for kind of the top down for when we're actually testing the behavior and testing what we can learn. So those are kind of the important concepts of how we start from a model that, you know, came out of nowhere and actually turn it into something that we're really confident that we can learn something about. All right, so questions about any of that? It's kind of where the le chapter left off. All right, so as I said, uh, looking forward, um, Thursday, we're going to have um, you know, a little more advanced thing. We're going to talk about chaos and randomness. So two different ways that we can take these models. So ways in which even simple models can produce complicated outcomes, that's chaos, and ways in which we can use randomness to make complicated models simpler. Um, so that's what we'll sort of talk about in lecture G1. Then um, a week from Tuesday, um, or a week from, I guess, today, so next week on Tuesday, then during the class period, we'll have an open lab where you can work on your final projects. You can come here and I can help you or Eric can help you on problems that you might be having um, so that you can make sure you're successful the next week. Then Thursday, um, Eric's going to give sort of an application lecture. Um, and then the next week of class, that Tuesday, we're going to have a final exam review. Wednesday is when your videos and reports are due that night. And then at 11.59 that night, Canvas will randomly assign each one of you a report to review and a presentation to review. And those peer reviews will be due Saturday of, uh, of that week. And, um, and then we'll have stage one Thursday. So that will be you know, on lockdown. You can come here during the class if you're okay with 75 minutes, um, but you know, there's usually nobody after this. So I can probably can go the full 90. Uh, but otherwise, you don't have to come here that Thursday. You can take this at home or whatever, but does do the lockdown browser for stage one. Um, then uh, stage two will be during finals week. That is an open book, open notes, no lockdown. And you can collaborate to come here during the period if you want to work with people. Otherwise, you don't have to. You can work at home alone as well. All right, so any questions about, um, yeah, but any questions about any of that? I guess I'll put that schedule up here and then I'll put the attendance exercise back up. All right, so hopefully pretty clearly make sure the anonymous questions are clear too. All right, so we'll finish up here um, a little early and I'll give you an attendance question this time. Put the URL in the chat. And um, question I have here is um, what, 
does um, boundary adequacy represent? So the term boundary adequacy, when we're referring to a model, how do we know that a model uh, has appropriate boundaries? How is it adequate in terms of its boundaries? So what, what does it include? And that's all I've got for you. So if you have anything else, I'll hang around up here. Um, otherwise, we'll see you Thursday. All right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording.